All right, so we'll get started. Welcome to the Michigan Works Association 2021 Annual Conference. My name is Marty Scarborough, and I'm the Business Services Representative with Northwest Michigan Works located in Traverse City. On behalf of the staff at the association and all of our sponsors, we thank all of you for being part of the conference and the session titled Inside Politics. Be sure to visit the exhibitor booths during the designated exhibit hall times. Before we begin today's session, there's a few housekeeping items that I'd like to share with you. Please make sure your audio is muted. We are eager for your feedback about the conference and the session. Please take a few moments to complete the short survey that I posted in the chat area. Presentations will be available post-conference on the Michigan Works Association website. And now I'd like to introduce your panelists for this session. Your moderator will be John Kaczynski, Director of Government Affairs with Saginaw Valley State University. The panelists include Chris Andresen, Senior Vice President with Dutco Government Relations, Allison Dembeck, Vice President of Education and Labor Advo Advocacy with the United States Chamber of Commerce, Peter Rudell, Partner and Co-Leader of Government Affairs and Regulatory Practice Group, Hanigman, Katie Spiker, Managing Director of Government Affairs, National Skills Coalition. And John, please take it away. John, you are unmuted. Let's hope that's the only time we have to say that during the panel today. Um, so thank you, Marty, and good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm John Kaczynski, Executive Director for Governmental and Community Affairs for Saginaw Valley State University and incoming chair person for the Michigan Works Association Board of Directors. Uh, today, I would just like to welcome uh, to you today's Inside Politics panel discussion. But before we begin our discussion, let me give you a, a quick introduction and bios of our, our friends that are here for our panel today. Uh, Chris Andreessen serves as a Senior Vice President of Duckco GR. He works extensively with clients to identify policy opportunities and threats to create detailed legislative and executive strategies. His broad experience includes working with companies, universities, nonprofits, and trade associations in the following sectors. Workforce development, consumer products, manufacturing, retail, biotechnology, renewable energy, criminal justice, mental health, technology, and higher education. Chris frequently presents to corporate board of directors on the overall state of Congress and the administration, focus, focusing on the impact their actions have on business activities and decisions. Welcome, Chris. Our next panelist, Allison Dembeck, is Vice President of Education and Labor Advocacy in the Government Affairs Division of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. She focuses on education, labor, and workforce development issues. Before coming to the chamber in September 2012, Allison was the Education, Labor, Pensions, and Welfare Policy Analyst on the Senate Republican Party Committee. Previously, she spent several years as a legislative assistant for Senator Judd Gregg, handling education, labor, pension, and child and family issues. She also was manager of government relations for City and Corporation, focusing on pension, health care, and payroll compliance. Allison earned a master's degree from the George Washington University and a bachelor's degree from Bing Binghamton University, SUNY System State University of New York. Welcome, Allison. Our next panelist, Peter Riddell, is a partner and co-leader of the Government Relations and Regulatory Practice Group at Honickman. He is an accomplished attorney and government relations advisor with more than two decades of experience around state government, public policy, and elections. Peter is widely recognized for his experience in representing clients with their health, insurance, education, and budget issues. He is also the chair of the Michigan Law Revision Commission. Welcome, Peter. Katie Spiker is the Managing Director of Government Affairs for the National Skills Coalition. In this position, she works to advocate on behalf of, to advance NSC's Washington-based policy efforts through federal legislation, agency regulation, and national funding initiatives. As a workforce policy expert, Katie works closely with members of Congress and their staff, as well as cabinet agencies, like the Department of Labor and Education, 
to develop and implement bipartisan workforce policy solutions to help workers and business, businesses succeed. Katie also partners with state and local workforce leaders to elevate their advocacy efforts to lawmakers in Washington. Prior to joining NSC in 2015, Katie was the Associate Director of the National Center for Women's Empowerment Equity at Wider Opportunities for Women, where she managed the design and provision of on-site and virtual technical assistance in the creation of case studies and policy briefs related to non-traditional occupations and occupational segregation. She earned a law degree from Georgetown University Law Center and a bachelor's degree from the University of Miami. Welcome, Katie. So let's start today's discussion um, with a question for Chris Andreessen. Chris, our first topic today deals with a policy issue that is continuously being discussed in Washington and really over the past 12 months has become one of the primary policy issues with the Biden, the, with the Biden administration infrastructure. Speaking to our Michigan Works community, why is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act of 2021 important for workforce and talent development? Thanks, John. Um, put simply, the, the reason that the infrastructure package is so important is because our infrastructure stinks, right? And that's not just in Michigan, that's sort of across the country. I think I saw Michigan got a, uh, an infrastructure grade from one of the civil engineering societies of a, a glowing D plus. So it's not an F, but it's pretty close. Um, and so that is a big problem for U.S. Chamber, US Chamber members and, and other businesses across the country and for you know workers trying to get to and from work, uh, taking kids to school, that sort of thing. We all, and it's something that impacts every person every day. And when you think about you know zooming out on the the broader political implications, every single member of Congress you know gets calls on this every single day, um, and, and they have projects in their districts and their states that could use additional funding. And so when we when we think about what it means, I think you know substantively, it's an investment in this economic recovery. Thinking about the moment where we are. And, and what actually could drive an economic recovery. And then you look at who supported it when it passed the Senate on a really strong bipartisan vote, um, not only Republicans and Democrats, but you know big uh, associations in DC, like the US Chamber, National Association of Manufacturers, Business Roundtable, um, all, a lot of the other you know, building trades and, and unions, et cetera, is a massive effort. And so I think that optically as a signal you know, knowing sort of where we are, what we've been through, uh, what the Biden administration wants to accomplish, it it represents a lot. Um, and so politically, and I think just as a nation, it's an important step. And you mentioned, you know, we, we've all heard the, you know, it's infrastructure week again joke. Um, you know, finally, finally, and, and I know for a lot of us on this on this particular you know session who worked on these issues for a long time, we actually have a tangible product. Um, that's not to say that it's perfect. You know, certainly with this Michigan Works community, I know uh, we were uh, pushing very hard for more workforce development type funding and initiatives included in there because one of the questions that many of us still have is. If you're you know embarking on this big infrastructure investment job creation tool is great um but where are you going to find the people to get to you know fill these jobs and and execute on these projects and you know it's it's a good moment too as a country to think about and it's been talked about too with with uh folks on this call job quality you know these are really good paying jobs that can set people on a pathway out of their of their current situation and provide that opportunity um so so there it represents a lot john it's an important it's an important political uh vehicle it's important legislation for the economy and i think it's also you know it's, it's important for the biden administration and you know uh republicans and democrats in congress to say okay here's a, a tangible issue that impacts all of our constituents let's solve it once and for all let's get Let's let's get on that pathway. And, and oh, by the way, yeah, it's a one point two trillion dollar bill. But I think we all know that that is just another down payment. And so what does that mean for the infrastructure moving forward? And, you know, in Michigan, I had seen some statistics, John, where, you know, the state would be getting for roads 
and things somewhere in the neighborhood of seven plus billion dollars over five years. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money. Um, there, there's other grant programs, certainly the electrification, you know, electric vehicles piece is important to Michigan. So there'd be a lot of money flowing to the state, which, you know, again, for workforce development, that may be money that could be freed up for the state to invest in other areas like we're forced to sort of support those initiatives. So it's, it's important for a number of way if in a number of ways. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we're still continuing, you know, collectively here to, to try and push to see that enacted, you know, it's sort of sitting there waiting for a, for a vote in the house at this point. And we were talking before we got on, I do believe that if it were to come to a vote, um, which could come in the next couple of, you know, in two weeks or so time frame, we'll see on that. Um, you would likely get, you know, two to three dozen Republican House Republican votes, right, uh, at a minimum, um, building on what you had on the Senate side. So all of those, I think, are really positive things. Um, it just comes down to some of these broader political questions uh, that that need to be solved. But uh, in a, you know, just looking at it as it is, it's a very important uh, piece of legislation for the folks presenting here, but also people listening in and, and the future of the economy and, you know, and our infrastructure, which are very closely tied together. Perfect. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, Peter, you know, viewing this from a, from a state standpoint, um, you know, from what you've heard and what you see, uh, where does Michigan stand to benefit from the, pa from the uh, passage of this infrastructure and jobs act? Well, we can fix the roads, right? I, I use, I, I left out the governor's, you know, four letter word there, but we can fix our roads in Michigan. You know, Chris, Chris alluded to some of the highlights that based on the bill that passed the Senate, right? $7.3 billion would come to Michigan for roads and highways. Over 500 million would go for bridges, a hundred million for broadband, which as we, we learned in our rural areas is critical particularly if we're going to have any virtual learning or any remote learning, which I d despite what you view on, on COVID, I think we're going to cons consistently have virtual options for both the high and the, the struggling achievers in our K-12 system. Uh, a billion dollars will go towards Great Lakes rec restoration. And then Chris, of course, alluded to the electric vehicle uh, initiative, which is designed to create uh, charging stations throughout the state, another 100 million plus for that particular program. So there's a lot of money that will be flowing into Michigan. It'll be flowing primarily through existing uh, Act 51 formulas that would uh, that would enable jobs in the road construction industry, in the broadband construction industry, and in all of these uh, particular industries that will will be in demand for the next five plus years. So fix the roads is is the bottom line for Michigan, I think. I, I sure hope so, because some of the roads that I drove in, even from my house today, some of the potholes could swallow a Buick. So uh, <laughs> so hopefully we can get those fixed. But let's stick on the on the federal kind of broader policy side. And just back to Chris. I mean, COVID-19, uh, you know, is on the front of everybody's minds. And we know the recovery is probably not going to be U-shaped or even V-shaped. It's going to take many years to get back to where we were at pre-pandemic. Um, we really need the long-term investments to get our nation back to a full recovery. Uh, in your in your opinion, what you've seen, what are some long-term investments that need to be made in workforce development to make this happen? It's a, it's a great question, John. I think when you look back at what's transpired, what Congress has done over the course of the pandemic legislatively, um, you know, obviously, and we, we talked about it in, in Ryan's opening session today, there, there was a huge investment from the federal government on expanded unemployment benefits, which you know were were lifelines for a lot of people. Um, I would say that that's not necessarily a strategy for an economic recovery. And I think that's where some of the investments that you're talking about in workforce development actually do come together and and again, sort of put us on a pathway out. Um, you know, we were for, with the Michigan Works system, I, we've done a lot of you know coordination with say the United Way looking at the Alice population and it's staggering to think about in a state like Michigan the number of people that don't have a high school diploma which is sort of like your entry level credential into the workforce but then who are also you know working in some cases more than one job and still living at or below poverty and so I think those are more societal based questions for all of us to think about 
is that should that be the case in 2021? Um, you know, it was the case back in 2018, 2019. Uh, you know, I know in, in working with Allison and some of her colleagues at the U.S. Chamber, it was a big consideration for businesses. Um, there, there is some potential untapped talent there. They just need a little bit more in terms of whether it is education, training, support services are huge. And I think that's where, you know, John, when you think about this next package and what's, what's coming, um, I think, again, as we're all seeing, COVID-19 we're not out of the woods by any stretch, right? It's still continuing to impact the workforce. You know, my kids are in school, have been for three weeks, which is great. I hope it continues. But, you know, if that happens again, um, where, where kids were to go virtual. But I also think that it's a really complicated recovery. And you mentioned how it could go. Um, it's not just, okay, let's open up more childcare slots and that'll bring, you know, more women and others back to the workforce. It, it is so, such a more dynamic question and answer than that. And that's why I think that having investments that, that bring together these different voices, employers, workforce development, economic development, education, um, you know, unions in some cases, all of, these, all of these stakeholders together to figure out it's not just going to be one system or another, one setting or another. You need a, sort of a, a coordinated effort. And I think that that's, we're finally at that point. Um, now, again, we can probably disagree on what the path forward is, but I think from a high level, that's what we need because what we're seeing so far and, you know, just looking at some of the numbers again in Michigan, those low wage, low skill workers were, we know they were very vulnerable before the pandemic, right? And they're even more so now, you know, Peter mentioned access to broadband. Obviously that was a big issue early on in the pandemic still is. And, it, and when you think about you know, just basically interviewing for a job on a computer. Does somebody have a computer? Do they have that stable internet connection to do that? Those are, you know, they seem like basic questions, but that, again, that feeds into that pathway because you can't even get on. You don't even have that on-ramp if you don't have access to those tools. And I think that that's what we're talking about more strategically in a broader sense. And that's why, you know, those investments are really important now because we know looking at the labor force participation rate, it's not an unacceptable place. We've got businesses in Michigan and across the country that want to hire. They've got good open positions ready. Um, but, you know, and again, I think it's a number of reasons we can't pinpoint one, but the workforce isn't there. And I remember, you know, end of 2019, obviously the economy was really strong. Um, and you know, the, what we heard from businesses was, well, there's not enough, the unemployment rate is so low. There's not enough talent out there. Well, guess what? The unemployment rate jumped, what, two, three times. And we still heard the same thing. So I think that sort of illustrates what we're seeing, you know, whether it is skills mismatch, you look at some of the industries that were impacted, uh, so significantly by COVID. And then you look at where the growth is. So if you look at, you know, retail, restaurants, hospitality, and then we were talking about infrastructure, you know, uh, laying fiber, laying cable, building roads. Well, you can see the skill mismatch there. Um, and, and so what does that what does that sort of reskilling look like? And at, it doesn't just happen. Right. Uh, people have a whole bunch of things going on in their lives that they need help. And I think that that's really what's uh, you know, we're at a trans transformational moment due to COVID, but there's other factors lingering too, automation, all of these things. If we don't address them, they will just sort of persist. And that, you know, you mentioned how, how that economic recovery goes will be impacted by that. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. That's, uh, you know, the, the points you talk about with childcare and, you know, we talk about transportation access and affordable housing, all major issues that we're, that we're facing in, in, in our um, state. Uh, but transitioning over to Peter, Peter, let's talk a little bit about the state political issues, really talking about the state budget. And, you know, we keep hearing, you know, about the surplus of federal funds in Lansing uh, that are impacting the fiscal year 2022 budget negotiations. And we all know that there, there's these competing priorities for those funds and in the workforce uh, d talent development network in Michigan would love to have access to to some of this federal funding. Um, what what are you hearing about how these federal funds are, are going to be allocated? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, John. So we have a we have a unique problem in, in Michigan. It, it's raining money, 
right? We have so much money coming from the feds. We have so much money from our state general fund that we're, we're at a point uh, that's really un unseen in generations about how to spend these dollars. And with, with um, you know, workforce development as a driving factor in the, the economic recovery post COVID, uh, the governor's come out with numerous programs and numerous ideas, right? Futures for Frontliners and Reconnect are her two biggest priorities, but she's also highlighted Going Pro as a continued program. So I think we're going to see some, um, you know, uh, combining of those different programs in some fashion between the legislature and the governor. In terms of timing and process, what we're going to see first, however, though, is we're going to see the state general fund budget get passed by October 1st probably around September 21st, we will see the legislature take its final action on the state budget, you know, just nine days before they actually have to. So, right, really getting in under the wire. And, and then after October 1st, the legislature will start really thinking about the federal funds and what they can do with some of the federal funds that are flowing through, through uh, ARP, ARPA, whatever the, the acronym of the day is for this particular program. But so I think we're, we're still a couple of weeks, if not months away from final resolution on that. And, you know, unfortunately for those of us who watch what's happening in Lansing on a regular basis, right? It's election year already, right? We, we may not want to admit it. It may still be an odd year, but all of these fault lines are being driven by what the governor gets to announce next year when she is running for reelection. So I think the legislature is going to hold their timing and delay their timing as much as possible in terms of finally allocating some of these federal funds. And I think that the legislature is going to um, try to continue to use existing programs as vehicles, as opposed to creating new ones. And then the, the final kind of caveat out there that I, that I think is still getting wrestled to the ground through the court system is the, you know, the Ohio court case that, that sued the administration over all of the restrictions over long-term uh, liabilities, pension, OPEB, liabilities and tax cuts that the federal government tried to attach strings or ha handcuff the states on this and, and the Ohio uh, governor and attorney general sued over this right away. And so I think the legislature would like to see greater pay down of long-term liabilities with some of this uh, surplus that they're receiving from the federal government. So I think we're still kind of a little early to see what's going to happen with the federal funds. First, we're going to see the state general fund um, enacted in a couple of weeks. Okay, so we're, we're, we're thinking legislative action next week, followed by a signing, and then October 1 to be determined how long that, that plays out. Correct. Uh, going back to, you know, you just mentioned the, the election coming up, and, and we know that Chief Craig in, in Detroit, from Detroit's making his rounds around the state, but so is, is Governor Whitmer. And, and, you know, back in June, she joined local entrepreneurs and business leaders to promote the Michigan Economic Jumpstart Plan, which would allocate a portion of these federal dollars that we're talking about to support and invest in working people and small businesses across the state. Um, in what ways does this plan benefit employers and job seekers in Michigan? Yeah, that's a, that's another good question, John. So, you know, this, you know, is a recurring theme from the administration. You're going to hear futures for frontliners and reconnect over and over again from this administration. Those are the high point uh, programs that the governor wants to to really make the linchpin of her economic development package and her programs going forward. So a lot of the money goes into those particular programs from her jumpstart plan. And again, this is this is using um, some state dollars, but but one of the biggest things that I think is getting uh, you know really not enough attention. I think Chris alluded to it as a as a major issue nationally is childcare. Right, the governor's economic jumpstart plan allocated three hundred and seventy million dollars to childcare, and childcare I think is going to be one of the driving issues for for uh, employers going forward because it is really one of the factors that is that are keeping employees home or less fully engaged in the workforce as we need them to be so one of the big tenants of that particular program is 370 million dollars towards towards the child care again you reconnect as part of it as as are some restart and and uh, micro enterprise grants those are kind of the the four key components of the jumpstart the Jumpstart program. Good, good, good. Well, uh, thank you, Peter, and and to Katie and Allison. We haven't forgot about you yet. We're now we now our questions are coming up uh, to talk more about 
uh, you know, President Biden's proposed 100 billion for workforce development in his American Jobs Plan, and and Katie, um, you know, the, the workforce investments are at risk of being negotiated away by Congress, and if that 100 billion is slashed, we won't be able to respond to the pandemic and the decade of digital and technological change that happened uh, in just the last year. Um, what is the National Skills Coalition doing to address this issue, and how can the Michigan Workforce Development System be helpful in that? Yeah, I mean, the, the framing that you have for this question, John, is perfect, I think. Um, you know, the president proposed $100 billion uh, investment in, in workforce development as part of his American Jobs Plan earlier this year, followed those recommendations with the broader recommendations for some of the other things that we've been talking about, child care, free community college, as part of the American Families Plan. Together, those two packages are moving through Congress or pieces of them are moving through Congress through the Reconciliation Package or Build Back Better Act. Um, but but the, the numbers with which Congress is talking about responding and putting recovery legislation together right now is really dwindling. So when the, the Senate Dems uh, passed the top line for what this package was going to be, it was a $3.5 trillion package. In order to actually move this through Congress, uh, Dem leadership is going to need just about every member uh, in their caucus to support the bill, which means there's a really big variance in how big of a package we're even talking about. So the idea of $100 billion uh, being negotiated away um, is something that, and I will get to the actual question around the advocacy that we can all be doing, but just to, to underline it, is something that is that is necessary for us to be advocating against that negotiating away, but it's also the the spectrum of the amount of funding that we are talking about for the overall package as that dwindles it becomes even more important to be raising up the message john that you said which was without these investments local businesses are not going to be able to upskill and reskill workers and local workers are not going to be able to have access to the good jobs that we were talking about as part of that infrastructure package an investment in job creation is only as effective as it is to as there are workers to fill those jobs um, and Congress has invested almost no dedicated funding in job training and in skills training for workers across the entirety of the, the response to the current crisis. Um, and so that's a that's just a huge underline to say now is the time for us all to be advocating and we're doing so in a couple different ways. Um, so, so first we're doing and organizing a series of outreach to members of Congress. Um, I know that many of the folks listening today are involved with the National Skills Coalition and with our skills fan coalition in the state. Um, and we've been working through both of those channels to bring folks in to have conversations with key members of Congress. Um, folks listening are also probably engaged through other national organizations in doing some of these meetings, and I can't encourage you enough to be part of either ours or their effort to ensure that members hear how critical these investments are. Uh, we also just a week and a half ago circulated a letter up to leadership that had more than 500 organizations signed on to it. Um, supporting a $100 billion investment in workforce development. Uh, the the sign-on for that is still open. We'll continue to iterate versions of that up to Congress um, as the negotiations continue. Uh, and once I stop talking, I'll drop the link in the chat for folks to, to sign on to that. We also have been working uh, with business leaders who care about this issue, ensuring that that congressional leaders hear from the from businesses themselves about the importance of investing in public workforce. We worked with um, worked in Autodesk also a couple of weeks ago to send up a letter with more than 100 industry uh, leaders, businesses and industry associations calling for critical investments in workforce as part of reconciliation. So the, the big theme across all of these is really um, that, that now is the time for having this conversation. And we are working with the members of our coalition including so many of the folks who are listening today, to ensure that members of Congress and the administration hear about the importance of this issue at this point. Um, National Skills Coalition CEO Andy Van Clunen sat down with the Secretary of Labor a couple of weeks ago in a fireside chat. Allison was a uh, respondent in that conversation. Um, and, uh, and the Secretary of Labor really drove the point home and said that we are at an inflection point right now, which could not be more true. And without these kind of necessary investments, we're not going to see the kind of inclusive economic recovery that folks on this call are working. Allison had a good smile on that. And I, I want to hear more about that engagement because it sounds like there was something either moved there or, or, a, or um, a side conversation to be had. But 
But Katie, staying with you, um, I understand the National Skills Coalition and business leaders for workforce partnerships are, con are convening industry recovery panels to ensure the federal recovery initiatives include investments in workforce training and supports to help workers and businesses adapt to the structural shifts in their industries. Um, can you tell us more about these recovery panels and the issues that they are trying to address? Sure, yeah, and it, it really goes to the theme that we've heard from, from everyone that's that's spoken that I know we're all teeing up Allison for her comments on, which is um, industry has been impacted by the current crisis um, in varied ways across different industries. Um, and so we've seen the impacts of obviously uh, the crisis on the healthcare workforce and the need to rapidly reskill um, and have uh, have both more emergency response workers as well as workers who have some of the respiratory training early on in the crisis that was so critical. As we talk about greater investments in infrastructure, we've seen the, the impact of, um, of an aging workforce on manufacturing construction industries in a way that's only exacerbated their challenge and need for skilled workers. Um, for the retail and hospitality industries, who are often be the industries in which people may go into for a first job, they're having an extremely different recovery than some of those other industries as we look at, at the ability of businesses to open and, and open at capacity. Um, and so we engaged with the leader leaders from more than 60 organizations, businesses, uh, the public workforce system community and technical colleges, community organizations, who, who are experts within those different industries to have a conversation about what are the kind of policies that the administration and Congress could, could support that would actually lead to an inclusive economic recovery. And you won't be surprised, uh, obviously, to hear here there's kind of two buckets of recommendations that we identified. So the first of the things that were really common across all the different if uh, all the different panels that recognize the fact that we underinvest uh, as a country in our public workforce system and we need to see effective and efficient investment in in, in workforce and in skills training. Um, another big thing that we touched on across the different panels was the need for investments in digital skills. Um, you mentioned John in the last in the last question the fact that we've seen this decades of technological change in a matter of months and recognizing that it's both access to broadband that Chris and Peter talked about, as well as the ability for people to use those devices and that broadband in an occupational context. We also heard a big theme across all of those different industries and conversations about uh, ensuring that, that higher education works for working students and supporting access to high, we uh, reset. Oh, I no. think we. Um, there also was a series of recommendations. Did my internet freeze? Katie, you're good now. I'm sure I said something really intelligent and interesting while I was frozen, but um, there was a uh, there was also so there were these set of recommendations that were shared across all of the the panels. Then there was there was a set of recommendations that really varied across the panels. So for our infrastructure conversation. Um, we talked a lot about what is the impact of investments that come from the federal level and go towards Department of Transportation and Energy, and how can the public workforce system be part of the local bidding and negotiating process that ensure that there is job creation and skills training as part of that package. For our uh, healthcare conversation, we looked a lot at what are the reimbursement rates for um, for Medicare programs and ensuring that that jobs are able to support people and that they have these living wages and that people have access to training throughout that that, that process. So I, it was a it was both a um, reaffirming for some of the things that folks have advocated with us in the past will have heard National Skills Coalition talking about, but also really focused on giving us the opportunity to have conversations with folks in the administration and Congress about what are the industry specific lenses and policy levers that are necessary to ensure that workers have access to the kind of skills training and supports that help meet industry demand in those industries. Thank you, Katie. And, and uh, one of the pieces that you brought up was um, you said about first careers in hospitality, and I, I found myself having a second and third career working in hospitality at the family restaurant washing dishes. And so uh, the, the, the skill sets I learned at 16 years old have come back to me when I'm 41 now. But that, that's just a little anecdote in Michigan of, that's, that seems like it's happening everywhere that we're all, if you own a family business or you're involved with a, a small business, that you're really working outside your, 
your eight to four job and, and helping out where you can. But thank you very much for those insights because a lot of the things that you're mentioning, I it personally resonate or personally resonates with me. Uh, Allison, so now to hear from the from the US Chamber, and and you've created this America Works initiative. Um, could you please tell us more about this initiative and how we can get involved on the state level to assist? Sure. I mean, so thank you so much for asking about the initiative, John. It's, um, you know, one of the things that everybody's hit on today already is that there there have been workforce challenges pre-pandemic, right? So we, and the chamber was working on these workforce challenges before, but, you know, over the last year and a half, those issues have, have been exacerbated. And we're hearing, as, as, as I assume everybody else um, on the panel is, right? We, you're hearing about it from everybody. It's everybody from the multinational companies. When you think of the US Chamber, that's who you think of. You think of those big companies. But we also have a significant number of members who are small businesses. And, and as you mentioned, right, the small businesses are struggling too. And so whether when you ask them, it's the, the challenges are, are one or two, um, you know, whether it's finding skilled workers, that's usually where it falls. And, um, and I think Katie, Katie mentioned that it, um, I had been on a panel for a National Skills Coalition. And uh, one of the things I mentioned there, it's the conversations around the chamber had been that we needed to do something similar in the workforce space that what we had done is similar to what we had done in the vaccine space. We needed an operation warp speed for the American workforce system. And so we that's how we came up with the America's Works Initiative. Um, it's in its kind of overarching um, theme, it's it's pretty simple in that the idea is to uh, help Americans acquire, acquire the skills they need for today's jobs. Um, it's to remove stand, uh, barriers that stand in the way of people returning to work. So we mentioned childcare, that's a big one. one. One that hasn't come up in this conversation, but another another big focus for us has been on second chance hiring and on veteran hiring, but there are barriers in both um, in, in both spaces. And then it's about improving the educational and job uh, training opportunities for the workforce of tomorrow, because the workforce of tomorrow is changing. We've talked about automation. We've talked about uh, you know electric vehicles. All of all of that is changing. And so while we have jobs that we need to worry about today, we need to also make sure that we're doing what is necessary to ensure that we don't have similar problems, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now. And then as we were talking about before the um, before the panel started. Thankfully, it is not in my portfolio, but the other big kind of component on this is the immigration piece um, and wel wel welcoming global talent um, through immigration reforms. And yes, does that include raising visa caps? Sure. Does it include include other immigration reforms? Yeah, it does. And and, you know, and, and we need to, to face that and we need to deal with it. And um, some of this is stuff that can be done right away. Um, there are programs like the U.S. Chamber Foundation's Talent P Pipeline Management Program, which is something that between um, chambers and the local employers can really start um, tapping into the talent that is all, that is there and, and looking <clears throat> for jobs. Um, some of it, talking about in the state level, it's about um, improving out-of-date data systems, right? So. The Chamber Foundation also has this T3 innovation network and in our jobs and employment data exchange programs. We need state help with, with that. We need state involvement with, with, with those programs. But if we don't improve those out of date data systems, how do we even know that when somebody posts a job ad that they are actually making sure that they're connecting to the right people who would even have those skills? And so these programs help um, help do some of that. And some of it is implementing there. There are best practices for hiring veterans and second chance hiring and, and those things need to be implemented. Some things are a little a little harder, take a little more time and require some, you know, bipartisan comprehensive policy changes on the state and on the federal level. Um, and, you know, and we need to, to work on those things too through advocacy efforts like Katie was talking about. Um, and, and really kind of rolling up our sleeves and doing it. I think the one thing that, that's been really great and, and Chris hit on it talking about the infrastructure bill is that for all the talk about how Washington is broken, it's not broken. Like we actually did get a bipartisan infrastructure bill that is going to make a really, really big difference. I mean, we haven't seen an infrastructure bill like this in, in, in decades. So, it can be done. It just people have to be willing to to put in the work and and have what are very often 
difficult conversations. And there's winners and losers on both sides of those conversations. It just has to be a willingness to do it. Thank you, Allison. And thanks for the, the, the piece about, uh, you know, veterans, because I know our Michigan Works agencies across the state, along with our post-secondary institutions of higher education, have been doing uh, all they can to get more veterans into the workforce. And, uh, and as a veteran myself, I always love to hear that. Um, uh, just pivoting a little bit, still with the U.S. Chamber, um, you have a strong emphasis on workforce development to be sure businesses have the necessary talent to compete. Um, what federal policies are most important to the Chamber members when discussing workforce development? Well, so what, the way we're looking at it now, it's kind of a I would say it's kind of a, a twofold thing, right? Especially because we are looking at jobs of today and jobs of tomorrow. So some of it is rethinking the traditional job training programs and, and trying to figure out ways to, to do a better job uh, engaging and supporting employers in, in this. You know, we need on the job training and we need things like apprenticeship programs that aren't just the registered apprenticeship programs. There are other ways of doing it. I know there's some controversy around, um, you know, the employer led, the industry led programs, but there are other ways to do that. On the job training is critical. There was a question in the chat about uh, how to help lower skilled, um, you know, and middle skilled employees. And part of how we do that is, is creating better incentives for um, better innovations in earn and learn in initiatives, in funding and subsidizing employment opportunities through apprenticeship programs, but other on the job training programs. If we don't, if we don't do that, um, it makes it a lot harder for employees to engage in these on the job training programs. And it makes it a lot harder for the employees to, for the potential employees to be able to learn the skills um, because it is also hard to hire somebody when they don't have the skills that you're looking for. Um, when you're talking about some of the, the jobs of tomorrow, one of our really big initiatives has been uh, the College Transparency Act and getting that signed into law. This way, people know when they're going for whether it's a certificate program or an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree, or that they know what, what kind of debt they're going to get into. What are their, you know, what's their wage potential? How many people actually graduate versus transfer out? None of that information is actually available right now. And the information that is out there is incomplete for a whole variety of reasons. And if we can better prepare students to make uh, make educated decisions, and that students on all levels, whether we're talking about your traditional 18 to 22 year olds going into you know a four year bachelor's degree, or we're talking about returning students going in to get a certificate degree, if we can help them make better decisions, I think that that also will help uh, with the long-term, um, our long-term skills needs. Uh, and then I, I think the last kind of big thing that we've been focusing on is around modernizing uh, the education and employment um, records in, in general. And that sort of gets back a little bit to, to my point about the work that we've been doing in the jobs data exchange and, and the T3 innovation network. It just, our, our education and employment records, state level, federal level, it, they're a problem. And so we need to improve improve those records so that we can allow for better matching for the right people in the right jobs, because we're just, we're not getting, we're not being able to make that connection right now. And and thank you, Allison. And, and I and it's, the next question really goes to the entire panel and, and we're talking, you know, we're talking about skills training, talent training. And this next question is about WIOA reauthorization. And, and we know, you know, it continues to be underfunded and it, it's in serious need of reform. Um, the question to all of you is, in what ways beyond increased funding does WIOA need to be expanded to assist more workers in, the, in a post-COVID recovery? And any one of you that feels confident to want to step forward can, can go instead of me picking on one of you. Yeah, I, I can start with that one, John. Um, you know, we've at least seen a little bit of, again, back to what, what Alice was talking about in terms of whether DC is broken or not. Um, there's at least a bipartisan recognition that WIOA, Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, has, you know, is inspiring. We need to have a, a bipartisan discussion. Um, I think the difficult thing has been getting those discussions moving towards some of the, you know, specific policy issues that you're talking about. Um, from my perspective, certainly, uh, you know, here in sort of a Michigan-centric audience, 
we're a little bit spoiled, right? Because the, the, the workforce development system in Michigan is much more mature, right? And connected and collaborative than some others. And so one of the really key uh, issues that, that the, the association has been involved in lately has been taking those best practices outside of Michigan to other places to kind of lift the rest of the system up. I do think that a lot of the innovation happens in workforce development when you involve businesses and employers of all sizes and these, you know, the, these sector and industry partnerships. That's really where you can then connect what the, you know, the in-demand occupations and what those, you know, skill, necessary skills, credentials are with your, you know, your, your, your local label market and customize those programs. Who are you talking to? Are you talking to the community college? Are you talking to other sort of skill-based training providers? And look, we've all mentioned the barriers today, right? So we're not even talking about that, but that really sort of zooming in on the local level helps you, helps the system, helps the employer, helps the job seeker make a much more informed decision to Allison's point on some of these broader, you know, considerations about what their, what their personal situation is, where the hiring's happening, what are these companies doing? What, what does that, you know, what does the training look like? What does it look like while I'm training? Is there an, you know, an on-the-job training or an earn learn opportunity? What does it look like once I graduate and earn that credential? What does it look like two years from then? Um, these are all really complicated questions, what we talked about earlier on. But I think doubling down on that model makes a lot of sense because you can bring people in like the chamber and other business organizations to say, let's let's make this much more intentional. I also think it's difficult with workforce to look at national numbers, you know, 10 million jobs unfilled, uh, unemployment rates. That's really hard to imagine, just like imagining three and a half trillion dollars is hard to imagine. Right. Um, so I think taking these decisions locally makes a lot of sense because then you can talk to the business leaders directly. You've got that ecosystem already in place. And certainly in Michigan, we've got a leg up. I think that a lot of the connectivity, um, you know, silo breaking, if you will, already happens in Michigan. That's not the case across the country. Um, and so that, I mean, I think rooting out some of those inefficiencies would do well for the system as a whole, but then also the other collaborative partners, whether it is businesses or, you know, training providers too. We saw it in the chat about, well, some businesses are afraid of, you know, red tape and bureaucracy. That's true. I think at the end of the day, whenever there's federal funds involved, there's going to be some sort of a mechanism on, on outcomes base. And I think that that's something that we all just need to understand and accept. Um, but I think those are a couple of ways, John, that we can kind of get the conversation going because right now, you know, there's a, there's a recognition that we need to have the conversation, but it hasn't advanced too far. Thank you, Chris. Katie, you've got your, your mic ready to go. Well, Thoughts? Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's kind of two sets of, um, of policy changes that we're hearing conversations around in DC um, with WIOA reauthorization. Um, maybe a third if I can't help but starting the conversation by saying that investment has to be part of it. The United States underinvests in our public workforce and in active labor market policies compared to every other industrialized country except for Mexico. Um, we can't talk about changing policy if we're not actually supporting local areas uh, ability to invest in these strategies. But Otherwise, I think there's really two sets of conversations that are happening. So the first is around what happened in WIOA when it was passed in 2014? How have states been able to implement some of those new strategies? What's working and where do we need additional policy change to help support some of those strategies? So to Chris's point around industry or sector partnerships, those were a required activity at the state and local level in WIOA. We did not see dedicated funding to it and there has been across the country a really varied adoption of meaningful partnerships that bring in that industry specific voice and need that drive towards industry hiring needs and industry demand. Um, there's also been um, a recognition across a variety of different programs, not just WIOA, but Perkins Career and Technical Education in thinking about how are we aligning career pathways across the spectrum of, of a, a participant's engagement with the public workforce system. And so really thinking about how WIO, WIOA reauthorization has an opportunity to improve the system's capacity to provide and align career pathways for, 
for workers. Um, there's also um, uh, things that end conversations around integrated education and training, modernize the, modernizing the eligible training provider list, um, improving data and performance accountability. There's also a whole set of things that have never been adequately invested in or supported for our public workforce system where there are pockets of really great things happening, um, but, but that we, we're finally hearing talked about on a national level. Um, so, so thinking about, especially given the time and, and moment that we are in right now, creating a comprehensive approach to retraining and reemployment for dislocated workers that isn't just an unemployment system, but is truly a reemployment system that meets industry demand. Um, there's also a lot of conversation around how are we supporting, as Allison was talking about, on the job training and incumbent worker training, even outside of an apprenticeship system. Um, because that's truly how we're going to give the most workers access to a pathway within their job um, and as a component of job quality. And that's another place where we're seeing conversations happening around how we're going to actually have policy and how do we engage the business community in having that conversation around what job quality means. And then finally, I think that it, um, one of the important things that we're seeing in a conversation around WIOA right now is how we're advancing racial equity in and with the public workforce system to respond to the disparate impact that both the health and economic impact of the crisis has had on people of color. Thank you, Katie. Allison? Katie? Yeah, so, so Chris and Katie hit on most of, of, of what I would say. I think the one thing, and in, in Katie mentioned investment, and I think the only thing I really would add is that we can't just have more money in the system. The money has to go towards training. So very little real money actually goes towards training. And that is a, that is a problem. Um, to just put more money in the system and have it not go towards training is not going to actually get at any of the things that we're all talking about. Thank you, Allison. And the next question to all of you, and, and this is more about advocacy for all of us, what, what should we be doing? And, you know, we've, we've been talking about, you know, alluding to a lot of the workforce issues that have been exacerbated because of COVID, but many of these issues existed pre-COVID. And we talk about childcare, we talk about transportation, we talk about housing, talk about access to quality training. Um, how, how should we as stakeholders be conveying this message to members and staff either in Lansing or DC? And uh, let's start with maybe Peter this time and we can go, go right through about how, how we should be advocating. Yeah, so right, advocating, you know, the first thing you have to have is some trust, right? So the first thing that we would recommend for all of our, you know, local workforce board members who are part of this particular workshop is making sure that you maintain trust with your elected officials, whether it is your locally elected officials, your state elected officials, or, or those representatives in DC. So the first thing is, is you know, maintaining trust and familiarity breeds trust. So right, maintaining a, a constant ongoing relationship. Uh, this, the second thing that I right, kind of generally would recommend is right, check in with the association on the key points, whether you're meeting with a member of Congress or meeting with a state representative. So right, we have a, a whole toolkit available to, to our local board members when they are having conversations with their elected officials. So those are, those are two of the, the big things, right? From, from the state level, right, we are putting a lot of our resources and our efforts around the Going Pro Talent Fund, right? So for, for Katie talking about incumbent worker training, right? We're, that is our that is our fund that is doing it at the state level that has been remarkably successful. And I guess if I'm preaching to Katie and Allison, we'd love to talk uh, more about the Going Pro Talent Fund and how successful it's been in Michigan and how we can replicate it in, in other states. So those are my those are my highlights, Johnny. Thank you, Peter. Katie, Allison, Chris, thoughts from a federal perspective? Well, building on what Peter just said, I think telling the story about what Michigan is doing and what people on this call are doing is always the most powerful thing that you can do with your, your members, whether it's through signing on to the letter that I dropped into the chat, engaging with National Skills Coalition or others on this call and with whom you work to, to contact your members, members of Congress. Right now, I think that having this question about advocacy is so important, John, because members and their staff are being inundated by people talking about the 
all of the challenges that that people, that businesses, that communities are facing right now. And staff want to give a solution and want to help address the challenges that, that folks are facing and giving them the solution of being able to support the kind of training programs and support services that are going to help people gain access to skills and get into good jobs that meet industry demand is a is a win win whether you're talking to a Democrat who's engaged in the reconciliation process or a Republican who wants to talk about the, the appropriations process or our, the bipartisan infrastructure deal. Um, and so I think that that across those different mechanisms, telling that story and ensuring that that members and their staff hear about these issues as they're hearing about all the others is what's going to drive towards a really important outcome when we do see legislation passed later this year. Thank you, Katie. Chris? Yeah, I would also add that one thing that we can always count on DC is change. And I don't know, I don't know the percentages, but I'm sure it's a pretty big number of members who were here in 2014 who are here now who may have never taken a vote on WIOA. Don't just understand the basics. And so um, again, in Michigan, we're spoiled, right? It's not every delegation that has an Andy Levin or a Haley Stevens who knows what the workforce system is at a federal and a state and a local level. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, if, if we're trying to talk about some of the, you know, whether it's investments or policies that, that Allison and Katie discussed, if they don't have that simple knowledge of what is the role of this particular organization, of the workforce board, working with employers. And again, we, we've, there are so many, we haven't, we, there's so many barriers and, and issues out there. We haven't touched on all of them, right? Um, but helping them understand that these are complex, but this is what we're doing locally. Um, to help address them. And that can then be scaled potentially, whether it's at a state or a national level um, as sort of a best practice. And that helps, that helps whether it's the member or the staff better understand and then better sort of position themselves in these you know, policy debates that, that are coming up in the, in the near future. Allison? Um, John, I'll just talk about one one other kind of advocacy things that specifically folks can do. Honestly, even on a on a, on a state level, probably even more so than a, than a federal level. I mentioned second chance hiring issues. One of the big things that we've we've been working on is uh, on occupational licensing reform. That at the moment. Um, there are a lot of, and it's all states, it's not, it's not just Michigan, but the number of restrictions on what you can do if you have been incarcerated, uh, does, it doesn't even have to apply to the crime that you committed. You have all sorts of occupational licensing restrictions so that you, for example, in many places, you can't come out of having been in prison and work in a hair salon. Um, you, can't get the, you can't get the license. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that it had anything to do with why you were in prison. So. We really need to look at what we're doing. There's an entire pool of talent that we are just saying simply because you made a mistake and you served your time, we're going to keep punishing you. And I think that it really will make a difference if we can look and make sure that, I mean, obviously there needs to be restrictions if whatever it is, the crime you committed, you know, if that's gonna be pertinent to the restrictions of whatever that job is, that, that that's a different scenario, but it should at least be be pertinent to, to the crime that was committed. And so occupational licensing reform, we've been doing a lot of talking about it with our federal members because it is something that they are interested in, but in many cases, they can't actually do anything about it. That's something that has to happen on a state level. And I think this group in particular could have a real impact by talking about some of those. So if you have personal stories about how you know, maybe you're, you're having difficulty hiring or having difficulty training people. Uh, if, if those restrictions are lifted, what that could what that could potentially mean for workforce, um, you know, expanded talent. Thank you, Allison. And, hey, and John, I'm not, can I just, one thing I ahead. missed, I would also say for anybody that's meeting with their, their state or their federal delegation, kind of building what else was bring your board, board chairs with you, bring some of the businesses that you interact with and with you so that they can say, yes, I have this problem. This is how I've worked with you know, A, B, or C to, to get this solved. We need to have a diverse set of voices. I know the National Skills Coalition does a great job of that. That's, Katie was mentioning their Business Leaders United Network. Combine those forces because when you go in as a workforce board, you know, director or stakeholder, you're, they're gonna expect you to say, we're doing really well and we need more money. But if you're able to say, look, I've got my board chair, I've got, you know, someone who's served on the workforce board for many years, 
here's how things have changed over WIOA. This is what we're working on. That's a much more powerful message. And so again, sort of walk, uh, you know, sort of walk in the walk about this is all of us together collectively. We can we can conquer so much um, so that it's not just us. It doesn't just rest with with the the workforce system. It's it's all of those components together. Thank you, Chris. And and just one comment before we end, uh, uh, Alicia Wallace on the chat box. Uh, Allison, I know you're not in charge of the uh, immigration portfolio, but she great, brings up a great point. In, in Michigan, we're not unique to this, that you know our top three industries are manufacturing, ag, and tourism. Tourism being very large uh, foundation of our service industry. And she brings up the H-2B visa program. And a lot of our cities that are involved in their primary economic drivers, tourism, uh, you know, this was something that existed pre-pandemic again, but really with the pandemic and knowing that when uh, we talk about supply chains for materials, we also talk about supply chains of people has been very much, very much disrupted. But that's a point to bring up because it's so valuable in Michigan. But we are at 11.16 a.m. Our panel went to 11.16 a.m. I think if I read the portfolio <laughs> right. So I thank Peter, Katie, Allison, Chris. Thank you very much. This was very insightful. And I hope uh, you found it helpful. And, uh, and to everybody watching, I hope you found it felt, uh, helpful as well. And enjoy the rest of the conference. On that, back to you, Marty. Well, thank you so much. Um, yes, thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to everyone that attended this. Uh, we hope that you have some great takeaways from this and enjoy the rest of the conference. Please don't forget to go to the exhibitor and networking break that is next and take some time after the session to video chat with exhibitors or watch their informational videos or go to the networking lab to be randomly paired with another attendee for two minutes to meet new people. So thank you everybody.